So thank you very much for your very kind welcome, um, Georgina. And before I start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we are meeting tonight, the Garigal and Bidjigal peoples, and pay my respects to the elders, both past and present, and to any Aboriginal people in attendance tonight. And of course, I have to thank you to um, local studies librarian, Georgina Keep, because you gave me a lot of encouragement and assistance with my little project. And I'm very grateful also to the wonderful people at the Randwick and District Historical Society. But before I get underway, I want to just show you the map of where we're going to be concentrating on tonight. And my talk behind the fences is basically concentrating on this little area. So you can see that uh, Centennial Park up here, Randwick Racecourse over here, these blue dots, dots on the map are all referenced in the talk I'm giving tonight. And over here is Coogee Beach. But you can see that the talk is very much around uh, the suburb of Randwick. And the talk that uh, focuses on tonight is on our European past. I'm sorry to say I'm not attuned for looking to clues for our Indigenous past. And I'm also very sorry to say we've probably long since built over and buried most of this evidence. So when we lament what we have lost, spare a thought for our Indigenous brothers and sisters. Now this location is what initially got me started on this little um, project. Uh, here hidden behind the trees is the Presbyterian Church and Ramick Junction's just a, off the picture here. Here's the Pres Presbyterian Minister's House, and beside the Presbyterian Minister's House is this very nice stone wall with a very nice iron fence on top. But then you look, you see there's a modern block of flats behind it. And next door, uh, another similar type of nice stone fence. And then a little bit further along, another nice iron fence. And I'd probably driven by these sites many, many times, but never stopped to take note of the clues of what was there before. Now, this aerial shot taken in 1984 shows Allison Park. And then here is the Presbyterian Church. And around the corner here on Cook Street, we can see that there is the Presbyterian minister's house and modern block of flats, an old house, modern block of flats, and the other house that had the fence. And looking at this 1955 aerial shot, it's interesting, isn't it, to see that the old houses were still there. You can see their front um, curtilage boundaries were all even, <laughs> and they were all large houses. Now, my next location sees us heading down Cowper Street. And this is the bus stop just before you get to Ranwick Racecourse, Allison Road there. And do you notice the uh, fence here, the stone wall fence? Very attractive brickwork. And this bus stop is where the buses, the drivers usually change over. Now here's a <clears throat> close up of the wall near the bus stop. And again, this is the wall. So this is the wall. And I think a lot of people would have thought, oh yes, it's there because of the tramway. Well, actually it's not, it's uh, earlier than the tramway. And the side of the wall facing the former tramway is polychrome brickwork laid in Flemish bond and it is heritage listed. And this is from the plain wall from uh, within the property of the original site. So in other words, your fancy brickwork is on the outside, your less fancy work brickwork is on the inside. Now, this is the location of this fancy house in today's age. And another short view of the same location. But this house, Normanhurst, was on the corner of Allison Road and Cowper Street. And prior to 1910, it's this wonderful house. And its name was Normanhurst, and it was built in the Victorian Italianate style. It was built for the prominent Randwick bookkeeper, Humphrey Oxenham, in 1887. 
And for a man so interested in horse racing, the house was ideally located opposite Ranwick Racecourse. The architect of Normanhurst was John Kirkpatrick, and the house was demolished shortly after this picture was taken, that is, in the early 20th century. Now, Humphrey Oxenham, well known in the horse racing world, was born in 1854 in Wattle Flat, New South Wales, near Bathurst. And an interesting anecdote about Oxenham and his promising start as a punter is recounted in the Australian Dictionary of Biography. As a youth, he won a bet of 100 pounds to one shilling that he could ride two miles between Bathurst and Kelso within a certain time with a pumpkin on his head. That win meant that soon after he set up a business making a book on country race meetings. And then in 1875, he moved to Sydney. The portly mustachioed Oxenham had become a familiar figure on Sydney race courses by the 1880s. Apparently, he soon rivaled Joseph Thompson as Australia's biggest bookie. His business interests extended to an intercolonial chain of betting shops and a mail order sweepstakes business which rivaled George Adams Tattersall's. Oxenham won the Melbourne Cup in 1904 with his mayor at Crazier, and he died in 1923, although he and his family had moved from Normanhurst well before his death. According to his obituary in the Sydney Morning Herald, Humphrey Oxenham, the well-known patron of the turf, was a very popular sportsman with all classes of the community, and he was noted for his open-handedness in the cause of benevolence. He made at least four visits to England where he raced some of his horses with moderate success. Now this slide gives you a better idea of the location of Normanhurst. Here it is corner of Allison Road and here's Cowper Street. And the next slide I'm going to show you is of the house located on the corner and it's part of an advertisement for the house. And the house at this stage was occupied by Alexander Forbes. And this impressive entrance was on Allison Road. And Normanhurst was 100 feet by 80 feet. And it had, according to the advertisement, a dairy, china closets, their toilets, and storerooms, and was conveniently located and well fitted up. And was also, the advertisement said, built in the Italian villa style, set on a sloping prominence overlooking the race course and must have been visible to all. And it had a panoramic prospect to Sydney University on one side and to the Blue Mountains in the distance. The photos reveal a substantial house set in generous gardens dominated by grass terraces. Now the gardener must have been very overworked, his tennis court, and you can possibly see there's a white horse nibbling away on the uh, grass tennis court. And in the misty background here is Randwick Racecourse. The most prominent feature of the property in this photograph is the polychromatic brick and sandstone capped walls. And the wall was punctuated by substantial sandstone pillars with carved capitals and ornate pedestrian openings on either side of the driveway entrance. Now remember our bit of remnant wall near the bus stop? It has this type of brickwork. We have some photos taken in 1909 of the interior of the house. Note the wide entrance hallway. It was 10 feet wide. And here's the drawing room. And just to give you an indication of the size of the room, well, here's a grand piano, and you can barely see it in the corner of the room. So the rooms were very generous. Now, Normanhurst was demolished, sadly, very soon after these pictures were taken, in around 1910. Now, just to get your bearings, this is the location as it looks to the day today. And note the tall building to the right here. This is known as the milepost. Now, in an earlier picture, you can see this is Normanhurst, and this house here in the distance is a beautiful house called Holcombe. 
And of course, this photo, as it says, was taken in 1909. Now, another reminder of where these houses um, stood was in the advertisement for the Holcomb estate when they were put up for sale, and that was in 1911. So here we have Normanhurst, a little bit further along, we have Holcomb, and the Holcomb advertisement is advertising a number of building sites. But also to notice the tramway line that's running behind the uh, two properties. Now, this is Holcomb. So Holcomb was opposite the race course and it was built by Robert and Marianne Richards and the house was in the late Victorian style. It was a two-story brick plastered to look like a stone house with a large garden and stables situated behind. The family moved in in 1882 and the house was custom built for them and Robert lived there up until his death in 1902 and Robert had a groom driver who would drive him to work every day in his carriage and when motor vehicles were available they had a chauffeur and Marianne bought a very large Daimler. They had 12 children. Here's a nice photo of the two of them, Robert and Marianne Richards. Now Robert's father Benjamin Richards founded Riverstone Meatworks, Australia's first private meatworks at Riverstone, New South Wales and this business created employment for hundreds of people and he and his son Robert were responsible for exporting Australia's first shipment of frozen meat to England in 1880. This important export meat trade along with the export of wool became the foundation of Australia's wealth in the late 19th century. When Robert died aged 61, Marianne was left a widow at age 55 with five sons and four daughters living and they ranged in age from Constance Carter, age 37, to Dorothy Madge, aged 15. And Marianne remained in Holcomb for another 20 years after her husband's death. She shared her husband's interest in horse racing and according to one of her granddaughters, she used to sit here, up here in the tower room and watch the horse races through her binoculars where she had a better view of the milepost than many on the race course. She had a footman who had placed five shilling bets with the bookmakers for her. And around 1923, when Marianne was 79 and all her children had left home, she sold Holcomb. Now this aerial shot taken in 1961 shows Holcomb still on the site. Here it is. And in the aerial shot in 1975, it ain't there anymore, I'm sorry to say. It's the milepost block of flats at this time. And what's our clue to something there at an earlier time? Well, look at these substantial stone gateposts. That is what drew my attention to the fact that there was probably an older house there. And also, so behind the site, many of you will know that there's a small road called Holcomb Avenue and it runs off Prince Street at the back of the building site. Now I've mentioned the tramway behind Normanhurst and it also ran behind Holcomb and the remaining indication today of the tramway is what is known as Kynaston Avenue, which is really more of a grassed walkway. And on the corner of Church Street and Kynaston Avenue is an old stone fence post. Other buildings on this site today on the corner of Church Street and Francis Street. And this area was all part of what was the Esme Ville, Villa or sometimes Esme Ville estate. And it was literally just over the hill to the east from Normanhurst and Holcomb. This advertisement for the Esme Villa estate is in 1920, just three years prior to Marianne selling Holcomb. The 1920 advertisement shows the house, Esme Villa, and note the undertaking, I'm sorry, it's hard to read here, but the undertaking by Randwick Council to form Prince Street, and also the fact that the vendor was contributing towards the same. Now the advertisement shows 12 choice blocks. Here they are. 
And it's interesting that they misspelled Francis Street. They spelled it for boy's name, but as we know, the girl's name is E-S. So it's Francis Street, Prince Street, and the, I'm wanting to show you another little lane here. And seven, eight, and nine are via tram lane. Now this is what Esmeville estate looked like in the advertisements. Here's the large house. Here's the tramway going by. Now the house was owned by Mrs. Esme Farrell and her husband, Colonel Farrell, and the land size was 220 feet fronting, fronting Francis Street, 218 feet to Church Street, and 140 feet on the south side, and 170 feet to the tramway right away along what is now Coniston Avenue. According to the advertisement, it was the sale of the season overlooking Ranwick Racecourse and the tram stops at the estate. So this is the advertisement. And I'm sorry, it's hard to read on your screens, but let me tell you, it waxes lyrical about the Esmeville estate. So it wasn't just modern real estate agents who sing proudly of the wonderful potential for building sites. What it says about this wonderful site is, it has a commanding position of the estate because it assures for all time extensive panoramic views of unrivaled beauty. The situation is high and healthy and the chance may not occur again of securing residential sites of so charming a nature in this highly favoured suburb. Special attention is directed to the fact that the property has been in the hands of the present holders for over 30 years and the chance now secures to secure one of these superb sites. The magnificent residence itself, Esme Villa, contained 16 rooms and all domestic offices, in addition to which are buildings which provide superior accommodation for stabling, garage, man's room, gas and electric light. It's suitable for a gentleman's home, conversion into flats or high class residential establishment. The subdivision is unique, both in point of position, conversion of access to the city and beauty of surroundings. There are 12 spacious building sites with access to good roads and the trams which pass through the estate. And note, the advertisement says 25 minutes from the city. And there was also mention of the fact that in the previous advertisement, the businessman will find the building sites here are highly eligible for his purposes. The distance from the heart of the city is traversed by the best tramway route in the metropolitan in 20 minutes. The time by motor is considerably less and there are good schools in the immediate vicinity and every essential for a happy home life is at hand. And the sporting man will easily recognize this as a convenient base. Esme Villa Estate is in close proximity to Ranwick and Kensington race courses. There is also easy access to Rosebury and mascot race courses and the tram which passes through the estate conveys intending and accomplished marksmen to the rifle range. Only one section by tram to Kuji, which provides the best surfing in the state and every facility for indulging in swimming and fishing. The Randwick Bowling Club is close handy and the Centennial Park is almost adjoining. And the cricket ground, agricultural ground and sports ground are within easy walking distance. And the speculator and investment investor will be deeply interested in this sale. The residents, if converted into flats, will yield a very handsome return and houses on erected on these eligible sites will sell readily. We know of no better place for a home or investment. The terms are exceptionally easy and pave the way for a very good profit. A large house, part of the original, original Esme estate, remained until 1982. Known as Hopeton House, 5 Francis Street was built around 1899 to 1900. And this photo was taken in September 1982, when the house was used as an alcoholic rehabilitation home, sort of a halfway house. 
5 Francis Street was between Church and Prince Street. Now the clues remaining of the Esme Bill Estate are the extensive fence and sandstone fence posts and the sandstone base which borders Kyniston Avenue. When you walk along the, the pathway, you can notice these things. An old fence sits incongruously, incongruously, incongruously sorry, with the uh, flats behind. And about 200 metres southwest from Esme Bill Estate, we go back to Allison Road, near the corner of Allison Road and Bradley Streets, just up from Ranwick Street, Ranwick Racecourse, and bordering the reserve between Wansey Road and Bradley Street is a substantial stone wall which probably formed the boundary of a grand house called Sunnyside. Now Sunnyside was built in 1862 for Walter Bradley, who was mayor of Ranwick from 1872 to 1874. He was a co-founder of the Sydney Zoological Society. He was also the Australian manager of Cobb & Co. He had 15 children. Sunnyside was demolished in 1909. And further east, going down Allison Road uh, towards Coogee Beach on the corner of Pitt Street and opposite Dutrick Street, the only remaining obvious clue to an earlier building on the site are the mature trees at this location. And there was another stone house here on this site until the 1970s. Now, if you go back up the hill along Allison Road, then head towards Ranwick Junction and turn south down Belmore Road, we come to Silver Street. Now, note the sign here. It says, please do not park in front of the gate. Now, the house was called Arara and it was built by William Duggan in 1900 and lived in by his family until 1975 when the house was bought by Ranwick Council. And in 1977, the house was demolished to make way for a much needed car park to service the shopping centre, according to the Southern Courier. The remains of an old iron fence and mature trees are the only remnants of the family home, Arara. Another similar house on Silver Street has gone, but its stone fence still remains. And further down Silver Street, we can see another stone fence post, another, Now, I've mentioned Ranwick Junction a couple of times. For many of you who don't remember trams, it would seem possibly a strange, well, why would we notice Ranwick Junction? Well, in the old days, the trams used to come along Belmore Road, and then they would go down, if they're going to the city, along this little bypass, which then joined up what we now know as Kyniston Avenue, or coming from the city, up they would come, and along here, or they would go along Cook Street and then go off towards uh, Bronte. Now, for quite a while after trams had ceased running, this land was used as a car park. And you can see how well built the car park was, full of sand and very even. And okay, the council must have put a little bit of something down on the surface, but you can see how beautifully car, the cars are parked and so on. So presumably um, parking regulations were much more relaxed in those days. But unfortunately, that site now has a block of flats and unfortunately the right of way that we used to have is no longer there. Now, trams were very important to Ranwick, as we have seen in uh, the previous advertisements and so on. And the tram line ser certainly served some of our grand houses. But we must remember that the tram workshops 
were just down the road and there are still a couple of clues to that history. The chimney on King Street near the intersection of Prince Street is such a clue. The construction of the large tram works complex at this site began in 1881. The area ran from Darley Road up King Street and down Dangar Street. This gives you a better, uh, the aerial shot gives you a better idea of the extents of, extent of the tramway workshops. Now at its height, the Ranwick, Ranwick tram workshops employed up to 1,000 men. And it's important to note that trams were built here at these workshops, not just repaired. And a large section of the buildings associated with the tram workshops were demolished in 1992, but some buildings remain and the site is now used for the bus depot. In this aerial shot taken in 1975, you can see the TAFE at the western end and there are also several buildings used by University of New South Wales and the bus depot occupies the centre of the site and further along is now the Montefiore nursing home. Now walking east, heading up King Street as if you're walking towards Coogee, on the corner of Wentworth Street and Stanley Street, you see this large stone wall and this fairly modern block of flats behind. And the construction of the wall, wall looks quite different from the flats. Well, here's what was there before. The picture of the house which stood on this site in 1919 and the real estate advertisement describes the house known as Glenrock as a fine cottage residence in the queen of the coastal suburbs. It is a well situated cottage residence standing at the corner of Wentworth and Stanley streets well built in the first instance kept in first class order throughout the building and grounds and commands very fine views. It is built of brick on a stone foundation, roofed with slate and has good tiled verandas at the front and side. The accommodation comprised fine drawing, dining and breakfast rooms, no less than five bedrooms, a bathroom, store or lumber rooms, pantry, kitchen and scullery with gas and electric light throughout. Detached are a brick billiard room with a garage doors designed to accommodate three cars. Altogether, Glenrock is a cottage residence suitable for a large family of good standing. The grounds are well laid out in garden and lawns, the frontage being handsomely walled with stone and railed with iron. All that remains now is the handsome stone wall, but no railed fence. Continuing east up Stanley Street towards Avoca Street, in other words, just near the Little Sisters of the Poor and the Emmanuel School at the top of the hill, just near the intersection of Avoca Street and Frenchman's Road is a small street called Astolat Street. Now Astolat is an unusual street name and it's a very small dead end street and some of the nearby streets also form an unusual street pattern. And that was my first clue as to what was probably a previous large property holding. And yes, in fact it is. So here is what was there. This is in fact Astolat and it was built in 1884. And Astolat, the name, is a legendary city of Great Britain named in Arthurian legends. And this picture of the house was taken in around 1925. But the 1911 advertisement for the auction sale is also quite interesting. Now this will help get your bearings. Now here is the Astolat estate. Here is Frenchman's Road and you can see the nice little tram trundling along Frenchman's Road. Here is Avoca Street. Here is Stanley Street. And here is Clarence Street, which is now called Market Street. And also for those of you who know the area, this is actually called St. Mark's Road because St. Mark's Road used to continue across Frenchman's Road down to basically to what we call Market Street and um, Guilfoyle Avenue. And then the continuation was Orange Street, which now is all named Clovelly Road. So 
what else do we know about this auction sale? Well, here is the house, Frenchman's Road, as I said, showing the tram line of Oka Street, and as yet the unnamed road, which will become Astolat. And here is Clarence Street, which then becomes known as Market Street. And that's what's on the side of Astolat today. Now, another thing that often gives us a clue to a former occupation of a site is sometimes the vegetation, sometimes it's even a name of a building. Now, this building is called Bishop's Court. And these old, very old palms. Now, the clue to this is, well, you do need to do a bit of research, but this is all part of Bishop's Court estate. So here's Bishop's Court in the old days. And here is Carrington Road. Here is Allison Road. And here is Brook Street. And Susan Street is actually now known as Clovelly Road. Now, this is Bishop's Court. This land was granted by the Crown in 1856 to Bishop Frederick Barker, the second Anglican Bishop of Sydney, as a site for an official Episcopal residence. The residence completed in 1859 was a two-storey stone structure with a slate roof. And according to several comments made by senior clergy of the day, it was far from palatial in character. Carriage Drive went along the line of what is now Marcel Avenue from Carrington Road, previously called Power Street, and the vegetation in the garden was a mixture of exotic and native. The effect of the vegetation in the garden to the Barkers, well, that's the bishop and his wife, was an Australian version of the Lake District. Bishop Barker was impervious to the clergy's criticism that Bishop Court was remote in position and restricted in size, However, in 1899, the church, that is the Church of England, was in need of capital, so the church authorities put it up for sale and put up, in fact, the whole Allison Road and Brook Street frontages. And a few years later, in 1910, Bishop's Court was sold and the new owner was a Catholic religious order, the Good Samaritan Order of Catholic Nuns. And they operated an novitiate there until in 1924, the house was destroy destroyed by fire. And according to Ramley Councillor's Specialist Heritage Report, the Bishop Court estate is one of the few subdivisions in Ranwick whose layout responds specifically to the local topography and historical development of the single estate. So it's worthwhile when you get a chance walking down in this area, it's a bit hilly, but, and then spare a thought for the, the poor uh, clergy were having to either walk or if they were lucky, ride a horse. The bishop was okay, he came in a carriage. Um, but we also think that there are possibly other archeological remains on the site. For example, these stone stairs and stone walls are very possibly left over from the original landscaping for Bishop's Court. Now, I've mentioned stone walls and street layouts as clues to a larger house or property that occupied a site earlier, but sometimes petrol stations occupy sites which had a very different previous life. Heading up Clovelly Road to the corner of Frenchman's Road, we find a Shell service station. It has been located here since 1961, but from 1923 until it was demolished in 1960, it was the Hoyts Clovelly Cinema and it had seating for 1,667 people, and many going to the pictures would have taken the tram. Now, here we see <laughs> the um, Hoyt Cinema on the corner. Uh, here we see the little tram going towards um, Bronte, the Long Frenchman's Road, and here we see the Clovelly Road tram trundling up. Here we see the Duke of Gloucester Hotel. Now, street numbering is often also a bit of a giveaway that perhaps there was a larger house there. Example, 14 to 20, that's four house blocks. And in fact, now it's a very large block of flats. 
But the aerial view of this site, taken in 1961, shows between 14 and 20, there was a very large house on this location. And Carleon was its name, and it was a large stone house, and it was stood here from the end of the 19th century to the 1960s. Now, continuing south along St. Mark's Road, we come to a site right next door, well, it's actually um, part of what we now know as the Eastern Suburbs Private Hospital, but it used to be uh, known as the Netherley Hospital. Now, it seems a bit strange, doesn't it, in um, St. Mark's Road, which is one of our prestige streets, that we have this uh, rather incongruous fence running along, a uh, colour bond fence, quite out of keeping with the style of fences along St. Mark's Road. And a closer look at the fence shows, in fact, well, there were two different brick fences. And in fact, here is what was there at this location. And these houses were demolished illegally while people were still living there. I've got to say it was absolutely horrendous. And it, they were demolished in 1984 and still have not been, land has not been built on. Now going around the corner, on Chapel Street. So we were just down there, it's Marks Road. So we're now walking up to Chapel Street. We see the old palm trees and hidden behind these trees and so on used to be a, an old house up until 1989. Uh, and it was a, pretty much of a wreck. Um, and it was totally overgrown and so on. Now walking south along Avoca Street, in fact, almost opposite Ranwick Town Hall, we find another series of numbering. Here we go, 71 to 79 of Oka Street. And so now, in other words, five property sites. Until the early 1960s, this site was occupied by Moran's Bakery. So here we go, 71 to 79. So you can see this was actually a pretty large block of flats, sorry, a block of um, land that was used by Moran's Bakery. In fact, a bakery was located on this site from 1917 until the early 1960s. And quite a few people remember the Sunshine Bakery carts and also the draft horses pulling the bread carts coming out of this site. You can just imagine, can't you, today opposite the town hall, coming out <laughs> along Avoca Street. Now about 200 metres further south along Avoca Street, just past St Jude's Church, we find this building which adjoins the header building, this attractive block of terraces. Now this building, particular one here has very high door opening as you can see very unusual for this type of building it's just before we get to the old post office and it has an unusual facade the window and door openings are not typical of the buildings facing Avoca Street in the 21st century but the building started its life as Crawford and Taylor's produce stores and the original building looked like this. Here we are, Crawford and Taylor, produce merchants. Uh, okay, this is a fairly modern picture of it because you can see there's actually a truck. But when it first started operation, there were horse and carts and the horses and carts would be able to enter and exit from that particular doorway. Now, continuing south along Avoca Street, just before Royal Randwick Shopping Centre, is another old iron fence with substantial stone posts, but no old house behind it. The land now belongs to Marcelin College. Previously, it was the Pines. And the Pines, which was built in 1860 for a Mr. Henry Clark, but at some time around 1905, it became a hospital. And in the 1940s, it was a maternity hospital with 40 beds. In 1948, it ceased to be used as a private hospital and in 1967 was sold to the Catholic Education Office for $100,000 and it was demolished shortly after. 
Now this is a Voca Street in the 19th century. You can see a horse and cart here. And also you can see a chook in the gutter and the iron fence railings and the old stone pillars. We don't see chooks along the Voca Street anymore and I'm pleased to say curb and guttering has somewhat improved. But when we continue along Avoca Street, we come to Church Street, sorry, to Short Street. And we see these oversized stone planter boxes, which are reminders of one of the houses that previously stood at this location. So this is Short Street in 1980s. And note the block of flats here. Well, if you stopped and looked down the side of that building, this is what you saw. You knew that, in fact, it was a lovely old stone building, had a 1920s facade put in front. The house was previously Glengariff, also known as Burnside, but an additional facade was added, so it looked like a not a very remarkable 1920s block of flats. And this aerial shot taken in 1984 shows you very clearly the outside of the old house and there with the 1920s new addition. And then here we are. This is what the site looks like now. We have the wonderful expanse of the Royal Randwick Shopping Centre. So here we are, back at the beginning of my talk. And before I close, I would like to thank again Randwick's local studies librarian, Georgina Keep and the Randwick District Historical Society for their help with material for my talk. And I also most importantly hope that you remember these clues when you are walking in your neighborhood. Sometimes a quick glance down the side of a house might reveal a different building material or even the indication that a new facade has been added. An old stone wall, a stone post on the boundary, or an old iron fence and a larger site, for example, petrol stations, and even the street numbering of palm trees and other exotic plants, they're all clues. Now, I think developers, small and large, like to save money, hence many old fences remain, and stone fence posts marking boundaries can save a lot of trouble when you need to get your property surveyed. So I'm sure a lot of people have kept these old markers as a proven indication of their boundary. So I hope I have encouraged you to go on your own walking adventures wherever you live or wherever you're visiting. And of course, don't forget in our part of the world, the easy way of finding out more about a site, well, of course, anywhere, I suppose, is to talk to people when you're on your walk. Don't be shy to ask if they have old photos, which they would like to donate, particularly to the library. And especially don't forget to come into Bowen Library and talk to Georgina or call into the Randwick and District Historical Society and check out the wonderful records stored in the Bowen Library. So, happy travels. Please share your discoveries with others. Thank you very much, Cathy. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Shall I stop sharing? Uh, that would be wonderful if you could. Um, Marvellous. So um, we had one question while you were speaking. That is not the first time I have heard that presentation, but I never tire of it. It's so marvellous. Um, so if anyone else has questions apart from this uh, question I am going to pose from Pam, please type them in now. I have one of my own. Um, but first of all, I'll ask on behalf of Pam Cathy, I've been wondering about the house on the corner of Ray and Dutrec streets, which is on its second major renovation in not many years. Um, so what, um, what do you have to say to that? I think we both know the name of the property that we're talking yes, about there. Yes, Earlwood. Yes, yeah. Earlwood. Well, they, the new owner, um, had permission to put the addition out the back. I managed to get a, um, a request that when they're demolishing that, I'll remember they had that dreadful um, pretend marble stuff out the back. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I thought it was true, terrible to just 
um, break it all down and send it off to the tip or some sort of, you know, um, just bury it. So um, there was a condition that that had to be recycled. But uh, yeah, they had permission to do that, um, which is a real pity, I think. But the floor plan, to be fair to the people, the floor plan was actually very difficult um, for that extension because the main part of the house was what still remains. And the extension out the back had been more for servants, um, which then, yeah, it's a sad story, really, yeah. It is. It, it's always a point of discussion when we uh, conduct heritage walks around Randwick, so. Um, but it's I also interesting, by the way, the, the name of the street behind, almost behind Earlwood, is called Eulalie, and that was Professor Dutrick's wife's name. And Professor Dutrick that was the first reader, it, well, maybe he wasn't a professor, but he was certainly the first reader in French at Sydney University. So he was a very prestigious person. And so Dutrick Street is named after him. He lived in the house. And Eulalie is the street almost behind, and that's named after his wife. So that's a nice touch. It is, it is. It, it, I, I, your amount of knowledge is just astounding, um, Kathy. So I have a question. If, of any of the properties uh, that used to exist in Randwick that are no longer there, if you had a TARDIS machine, which one is the one you'd like to actually uh, go back in time to and, and enter and have a look inside? Would it be the oh. ones overlooking the race course um, like Colcom or Sunnyside or would it be the ones in uh, Dutrec and St. Mark, St Mark's Road that overlooked the ocean? So, I think I would go back to Normanhurst um, but the other thing I would love to know, and really I should start researching this, but you might already know the answer yourself, is that there was such a turn down in terms of Australia's prosperity around the turn of the 20th century, and also a change in some laws, and also a shortage of labour, which meant that a lot of the big houses couldn't really be easily maintained. Well, one, the owners didn't have the money themselves, but also there was such a shortage of servants, um, which in some ways might've been good because maybe they could have got a job, job somewhere else, um, or I'm not quite sure, but I, I will, it's very sad, isn't it, that around that time, so many houses were lost. But the other thing I find interesting, Georgina, is when you look at the advertisements about the properties when they were sold, the fact that our area was referred to as prestigious and so on and so forth, I mean, it gives you an indication of the quality of life that people were anticipating living here as well. So I think sometimes it's, it's interesting to not just look at the house, but to also look at the advertisements that tell you about the house and, and so on. I think you definitely get the impression of the grandeur of the properties from the remnant stone walls that are still extant mm. um, all over our city. There's a few more questions buzzing in, so I'm conscious of time here as well. So Judith uh, says, thank you very much, Kathy, for an interesting presentation. It was so informative. Having grown up in Randwick Coogee, I could follow all your maps very easily. And I have mm -hmm. to say, Judith is currently the Vice President of Randwick and District Historical Society um, that you have acknowledged in the course of your research um, and also the Randwick City Library as well. So both um, those organisations can assist people with historical research. Um, I've got another question from Hazel Baker. Is there a history book of Randwick that contains some or all of this material? It would be wonderful to be able to refer to it at home. Um, the library can actually assist you, Hazel, uh, with the last history of Randwick that was published by Randwick City Council. It's authored by Pauline Kirby, a professional historian. That is available for sale still at um, all libraries and also the council for $69.95. It's a 400-page uh, hardcover book. It's also it's very available. heavy. It's, it's very, very heavy. <laughs> <laughs> Both on content and in your library bag on the way home. Yes. <laughs> so it is also available for loan from the library as well. Oh, uh, and can I tell um, Hazel, um, because I know where she is from, um, someone today actually emailed me some more research that he'd done. He came 
my talk when I was able to do it live. And he did more research on the Esmeville estate. And so when I update my um, story again, uh, Georgina, I'll include some of the photos that he has got, but he's also got a very good map of Kyneston Avenue and the area around there. So tell Hazel, I will email her the map that will give her a bit more information too. Yes, and we did have ideas to progress this to a heritage walk as well. So we're still uh, workshopping that idea in our spare time. Oh, wait till my grandsons come and visit. They'll be fantastic hosts. <laughs> they would be. They'll, they'll um, lead us around the streets of Randwick. Gay has a question for us. Can you tell us about uh, the two houses that were demolished during the night time? I'm not familiar oh. with that story. Uh, it was terrible. Tell, yeah, it was absolutely horrible. Um, it, it caused a huge rump rumpus and it was horrendous to think that people were still living in that house. It happened basically late Saturday night or early Sunday morning. And um, so we used to play tennis in the gully down behind when it was still Sydney boarding, Sydney Grower boarding school. And so when we were going down on that Sunday morning to play tennis, there were all lots of people standing around and so on. The places were shambles. Um, anyway, um, they were not allowed to build on the site for at least 10 years. And um, to date, they haven't built on it um, at all, but I don't know what's gonna happen there because it could be worse. I mean, in the sense that they might build more high rise or they might extend the hospital, I'm, I'm not sure because the amount of hot land they have there in that site, one of my near neighbors had a, an accident and they thought he'd broken his back and um, the ambulance took him to the land behind that Eastern Suburbs private hospital within their site and the helicopter landed there and took him off to um, uh, North Shore Hospital for, um, because they thought he'd broken his back because it turned out he had, but um, there's a lot of land there, yeah. Um, we have a question, any connection um, to Normanhurst, the house in the suburb up near Hornsby that we know of? Yes, I don't know. It's possible it's just the same choice of name, isn't it? Possibly, yes. Yes, yes. It could, as we both know, uh, people chose house names that harked back to where they originated from in Europe generally, if they were European migrants to this country um, or... Um, Often it was a family name that had some sentimental value as well, but it could have been that the family Norman Hurst had some connection there. Mm -hmm. um, Rob says, thank you so much for the presentation, Kathy. Fascinating. I noticed that the slim pathway you mentioned, which was used to run off Church Street along the old tram line, is now no longer accessible to the public. Is this change permanent? Yes, is unfortunately. That... Okay, so that answers that question for Rob. Yeah, no, it's, it's a, it was a really bad decision. Yeah. It wasn't Castle's fault, but um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Linda would like to know about the tall sands sandstone plinth at the corner of Avoca and Belmore Road, Avoca Street and Belmore Road. Uh, it's not going into my memory bank. Um, I'm just trying to Avoca and Belmore Road. Um, can she give me another hint? Well, um, no, but maybe she can. The only one that I know is uh, got a statue on the top of it in front of the um, Cap Captain Watson's residence. That's the yeah. only sandstone plant that I know in that yeah. vicinity. Yeah. No, it's not bringing your bell. Could email and then yes um, okay yeah. Hazel said brilliant thank you for the answer um Lindell what was on the Jewish school side on the corner of Evoke Street and Clavelli Road any anything significant on the Clavelli Road and on the corner of Evoke Street and Clavelli Road on the Jewish school site so the um other side of the road to what we were discussing earlier oh you mean the um the Little Sisters of the, like opposite the Little Sisters. Yes, yeah. Uh, yes, um, but you can still see it if you are lucky enough to get a tour through the school. Emmanuel School does open the school 
um, mm. every once in a while um, and you can get a tour through it so uh, you can see I forget I'm sorry the name of the convent that was there up until um, recent times and there was a house there that's still there that pre deceased uh, pre was earlier and the chapel um, is still there but it's used as the Emmanuel School um, hall where they have like concerts and so on but you can still see that it's um, a chapel yes okay um, maybe this is the last question that we have time for this evening um, do you know Kathy anything about the big old house with a turret left-hand side as you go down Cowper Street it has a trampoline in the front garden <laughs> <laughs> just so you can identify which one we're talking about apart from the turret so I'm not familiar with that one but um, um, maybe. Yes, I possibly do but can't remember but can you can I also please tell people that the other thing that's a really handy thing to have when you're walking around the streets of the city of Ranwick um, Try and buy, and they're not expensive, um, the books that the Randwick Historical Society put out, the Ran various Randwick Rambles, and they've got a map, in, always got a map in the centre, and, um, and then it tells you the names of the various um, places that used to be located there. Yes, we also have Art Deco Walks on the Council's yes. website of Randwick and Coogee. And we have in the past done Victorian uh, walks of Randwick as well, as you know. Mm. So yes. um, there's plenty of scope for more work and research. I was looking up today, Kathy, when I was researching for this um, particular um, presentation. It's over eight years since you first came to me with your quest for this research. Um, so thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, and sharing your passion for the history of Randwick. I'm sure it has been a trip down memory lane for some of us. It has also um, been a great showcase for the theme of History Week this year, which is what is history good for? 